B. Collins. Peter B. Collins News and Comment. It's Tuesday, May 8th, 2018. A day that will live in some infamy. You know, Donald Trump is all about branding, right? His inflated net worth, he claims, is up to $10 billion. And a lot of that is based on what he infers as the value of the Trump brand. So as a guy who cares a lot about branding, Donald Trump has rebranded the United States of America as a rogue, unreliable nation. By making the moves to scuttle the nuclear agreement with Iran, the United States, and five other countries... Trump has put us on a path to war, a very dangerous day in American history. And he ignored the pleas of the European leaders and thoughtful people in the United States, even those who agreed with him that Iran should be further constrained related to its missiles and its regional operations. That wasn't part of the scope of the deal that was negotiated. And Trump knows that a deal is a deal until you just decide that you're such an egotistical, narcissistic asshole that you can declare that you're not bound by a deal that was made by your predecessor. And this is what the agreements between nations are based on. Sincerity and reliability. And Trump exhibits neither. And as I've pointed out, and I'm far from the only one, it is so hypocritical and just, (laughs) it is contradictory to be pulling out of a deal with Iran in such a manner of spectacle. At the same time, you're trying to coax North Korea into a similar agreement. It is just utterly ridiculous. But... Trump takes his cues from Benjamin Netanyahu and the most extreme government the state of Israel has seen, at least in my lifetime. And that's what really galls me, is that Trump is the puppet here. A lot of people say, oh, he's Putin's poodle, he's Putin's puppet. But he's a puppet to Netanyahu, who last week dug up this trove of uh, dodgy information, much of it dating back 15 years, used to claim that Iran lied its way into this agreement. So we will pay a price for this. And Trump's idiocy here is something that we will live with, I believe, beyond his presidency, however short or long that may be. And, you know, withdrawal is not something that is even allowable under this agreement. So it truly is a rash act. I don't want to escalate it to an act of war. But it may turn out that way in hindsight. Now, I haven't seen Trump's teleprompter speech yet. But I'll catch up with that this evening. He's quoted as saying that the flaws in the accord lead him to conclude that we cannot prevent an Iranian nuclear bomb under the decaying and rotten structure of the current agreement. And he loves all that extreme language, you know, rotten, (laughs) decaying. This agreement's only a few years old. You may disagree with it, But it is hardly rotting because the inspections regime has been pretty effective. Ten times the Iranians have had to certify their compliance, and the U.S. has had to affirm that. And that's what Trump is actually, uh, that's the maneuver he is making here. He is refusing to further affirm compliance by Iran with the agreement. (laughs) And one of his statements, you know, these things just jump out. This is a quote cited by the Washington Post. The United States no longer makes empty threats. Oh, yeah? Trump does that all the time. Now, how will this practically play out? Well, it's not really clear. But Trump will probably reinstate sanctions on a portion of or the entire economy of Iran. 
These sanctions will probably uh, be imposed over the next 90 to 180 days. And here's an unusual opponent, Jeff Flake, who is this mild-mannered, goody-two-shoes senator from Arizona who is not seeking re-election because he couldn't cover his far-right Trumpian flank. Quote, the agreement obviously had problems it didn't address, Iran's malign behavior or ballistic missiles. But after you're in it, and Iran has already realized the benefits of it, to now allow them to get out of their obligations on the nuclear side is foolhardy. And it also says more about our willingness to work with our, our allies. We're having enough problems around the world in terms of our reliability, whether it's trade or commercial engagements or security arrangements. To add this now at this point would not be good for us, particularly the knock-on effects of other arrangements, perhaps with North Korea. See, I'm not the only one. <laughs> and, of course, we are learning more about Black Cube, the private Israeli investigation firm. They dig up dirt for cash. That's how it works. And we're learning the details of how they were targeting two Obama administration officials who were involved in winning congressional approval of the Iran deal. But they didn't help negotiate it. They're Ben Rhodes, the former national security advisor, and a guy named Colin Call, K-A-H-L, who was national security advisor to VP Biden. Black Cube sent emissaries who posed uh, with fake identities working for non-existent companies that had phony websites. And they approached this guy Call's wife, purporting to help her fund her charter school in Washington, D.C. And it appears that Sebastian Gorka may have been a conduit for the connection between the Trump administration and Black Cube. We don't know at this point who paid Black Cube, who they were contracted by. But it's got to piss off people at the CIA because they're saying, hey, this is our job. <laughs> Of course, and the FBI, too. Uh, Trump is at odds with them over the Russiagate stuff. But it, ha it, it does show that they had to outsource their dirt digging because they couldn't rely on the usual actors to cooperate with this White House. And more troubling, Black Cube was also investigating journalists. Jeffrey Goldberg, editor of The Atlantic, Mark Landler, New York Times White House correspondent, Andrea Mitchell of NBC News, Glenn Thrush, a Times reporter who had covered the White House. And the Black Cube efforts went in other directions as well. Robert Mackey writes at The Intercept that uh, this firm also had been hired to investigate the victims of Harvey Weinstein's sexual predation. Now, I'm not drawing any linkage between Harvey Weinstein and Black Cube's investigation of George Soros and of Ben Rhodes and this Colin Call. But it shows the murky world where money can buy you a whole lot of things. Just a month ago, Black Cube vehemently denied it was the Israeli private intelligence firm Hungarian intelligence sources had blamed for an elaborate smear campaign targeting Hungarian rights activists and groups that receive funding from George Soros. Now, he is a boogeyman of the far right and of the far left. And I'm kind of neutral on Soros. I realize where he parks his money. And I realize where he got his money. But I've never believed that he is as influential or as evil as many of his detractors claim. So we're going to hear more about Black Cube. And I've also learned from an interesting article published at Bloomberg News that Peter Thiel, you know, he's the Trump supporter from Silicon Valley. He's an out gay man, which is unusual for a powerful Republican. And one of his companies is Palantir. It was funded by the CIA's venture capital arm, InQtel, and they deal with big data. And one of their contracts is with the International Atomic Energy Agency's uh, effort to verify Iranian compliance with the 2015 agreement. And Peter Thiel was at the White House as recently as April 4th, just hours after Trump spoke with Netanyahu about Iran. We don't know what they discussed, 
But it appears that Palantir is going to lose a contract here. And uh, I, I'm sure Trump will grease him with something else. There are other upwellings in the region. An Israeli cabinet minister, perhaps emboldened by Trump's announcement today, threatened yesterday to destroy the Syrian regime and even assassinate Bashar Assad if Iran launches strikes against the Jewish state from within Syria. Quote, if Assad allows Iran to turn Syria into a military vanguard against us to attack us from Syrian territory, he should know that would be the end of him, the end of his regime. At the same time, Hezbollah, which is widely viewed as an extension of Iran, it is a military and political group in Lebanon, and it just increased its uh, parliamentary representation by about a third in elections that were held over the weekend. I believe some Lebanese look to Hezbollah to protect them from an Israeli war or just casual bombing of Lebanon. So everybody is <laughs> amping up, ramping up, and Trump is putting out the fire with gasoline. And I don't deserve credit for that line. It came from a David Bowie song called Cat People. Back here in the U.S. of A., the fundamentally disqualified and deeply flawed candidate to run the CIA, Gina Haspel, is getting more traction with a little help from the mainstream media. Yes, corporate media like the New York Times, here's their headline. Gina Haspel has the experience to run the CIA, and that may be her biggest problem. Well, the experience is that she participated in the torture programs. She participated in the cover-up of the torture videotapes. And it is fair to say that there are Democrats who oppose Gina Haspel selectively now, who supported John Brennan when Obama promoted that guy who had the same general exposure to torture. Uh, he didn't go to the black site in Thailand that we know of and actually preside over a session of waterboarding. But to me, their liability, their participation, their culpability is about the same. And when you look at this picture, do not let Barack Obama escape responsibility. His failure to hold people accountable, his, you know, breezy little phrase that he was looking forward, not backward, and wouldn't be prosecuting or investigating the torture, the claims that led us to war that were false. Many other bad actors, including the banksters. Well, Obama is the guy who created the conditions for Gina Haspel to be promoted to run the CIA. And for many Democrats to support her, including Leon Panetta. James Clapper, I, I don't know that he's a Democrat, but he served under Obama. And, of course, Mike Hayden, who plays both sides of the street so effectively. He was helping Gina Haspel at a murder board, a fake debate, a mock interview session over the weekend. And so all the spooks have uh, really coalesced around the Gina Haspel nomination. The rank-and-file members of the intelligence community, represented by, by VIPS, Veteran Intelligence Professionals for Sanity, they issued two public memos today, the first opposing Trump's move to withdraw from the Iranian agreement, and the second, which I hold here, opposition to Gina Haspel as CIA director. Quote, putting Haspel in charge of CIA would undo attempts by the agency and the nation to repudiate torture. The message this would send to the CIA workforce is simple. Engage in war crimes, in crimes against humanity, and you'll get promoted. Don't worry about the law, don't worry about ethics, don't worry about morality, or the fact that torture doesn't even work. Go ahead and do it anyway. We'll cover for you, and you can destroy the evidence, too. Later, it reads, The torture program and similar abuses at military-run prisons in Iraq were among the greatest recruitment tools that al-Qaeda, the Islamic State, and other bad actors ever had. It was no coincidence that the Islamic State paraded its prisoners in front of cameras wearing orange jumpsuits like those worn by Guantanamo Bay prisoners before beheading them. Haspel and others at the CIA who engineered and oversaw the torture program are at least partially responsible for that because they showed the world how the United States sometimes treats captives. 
and this open letter about bloody Gina includes the signature significantly of John Kiriakou, the former CIA counterterrorism officer who went to prison because he acknowledged that the CIA had tortured people. Jason Leopold at BuzzFeed has a, a good report, and it's good because it's based on actual documents. I've been critical of some of Jason's reporting in recent months because it dives into the anonymous sources, the uh, calculated leaks that are fed to the media, but not this story. He got 300 new CIA, uh, 300 pages of newly declassified CIA documents about rendition, detention, interrogation. And I hope senators will raise questions about uh, rendition. It was kidnapping, pure and simple. And it's wrong. And we've papered it over, you know, there's, there's, no, there's no Guantanamo or Abu Ghraib for rendition. But when you look at the uh, Abu Omar case from Milan, at others where we scooped up the wrong guy, tortured him, and then said, oh, never mind. Uh, that is a program that needs deeper exposure. Anyway, Gina Haspel ran the CIA's counterterrorism center. From uh, She was deputy group chief from 01 to 03 and senior level supervisor from 03 to 04. Those are the heaviest periods when rendition and torture were the flavor du jour. And Leopold goes on in the article to cite new information that shows that the people conducting the torture felt that they had squeezed everything they could out of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and Abu Zubaydah, yet they were instructed to keep waterboarding. And we need to know Gina Haspel's role in the chain of command. I doubt if it will surface in these hearings. And Glenn Greenwald has a great think piece about all this, and he deserves credit for his characterization of the democratic tactic called villain rotation. And he describes it this way. They always have a handful of Democratic senators announce they'll be the ones to deviate this time from the party position and try to block a confirmation. But the designated villain constantly shifts, so the party itself can claim it supports these measures while an always changing handful of their members invariably prevent it. So what he is predicting that is that enough Democrats will support Gina Haspel's confirmation, while the party will posture that they're really, really, really against it. And it's just a couple of guys and gals who decided that the nation was calling them and they had to support this woman to run the CIA. And Greenwald continues, if Haspel is confirmed, it will be because a certain number of Democratic senators join with the GOP caucus to support her while allowing the Democratic Party to claim it tried to stop her by pointing to a majority of feudal Democratic votes against her. That's why the record of the Democratic Party over the last 17 years makes it difficult to believe that Democrats will unite to kill her confirmation. And I'm afraid Greenwald is correct. I'd love to be wrong about this. I'd love to eat some crow a week from now when we see Gina Haspel withdraw. But I don't think that's going to happen. Every day I pause for a minute to thank the people who support my work at the Peter B. Collins podcast with your subscriptions. Julie Dupree, Jim McHugh, DGL, Sandra Fish are the names I mentioned today. These are people who kick in 5 or $10 a month to validate and support what I do and to help pay the bills here. And I invite you to participate. I need more subscribers to make this viable, and I'd like you to be the next one to sign up. Why don't you pause the podcast here, go to peterbcollins.com, pull on the menu tab, then click on Become a Subscriber. You'll land on the sign-up page, easy options, $5, 10 $20 a month, the $50 annual subscription. As always, if you're allergic to PayPal, because uh, Peter Thiel was one of the founders, you can communicate with me by the U.S. mail. My box is 15660, San Rafael, California, 94915. That's box 150660, San Rafael, 94915. Well, today is a superish Tuesday. It's not a presidential primary year, so we have four primaries, West Virginia, Indiana, Ohio, and North Carolina. These are all purple to red states. And, of course, in West Virginia, we've seen the uh, coal, coal criminal, Don Blankenship, 
run racist commercials where he talks about China people. Uh, <laughs> and it appears I, I, there aren't a lot of polls out about West Virginia. But I think Blankenship may pull this off. It'll embarrass Trump. I'm happy to see that. He could provide a, an easy roadkill for uh, Democrat in name only, Joe Manchin, in November. But he also could rally the uglies in West Virginia, and there are plenty of them. Across the border in Ohio, Dennis Kucinich is facing off against Richard Cordray, and it's been a muddy Democratic primary as Kucinich has been pilloried from the, the, the Democratic right because he doesn't buy the Trump-Russia narrative and because he met with Bashar Assad in Syria. Now, I don't think that foreign policy has much to do with the governorship of Ohio, but they'll do anything to stop Dennis Kucinich, and I hope he pulls out a victory uh, in the Ohio primary tonight. Oh, and Mike Pence's, Mike Pence's big brother, Greg, is running for a congressional seat in Indiana. Nancy Pelosi, who is uh, presiding over the selection of many conservative candidates to run in Democratic primaries this year, we've told you about the spooks and the military veterans, about the way they have passed over true progressives to promote people who most recently were registered as Republicans. And we've got a case of that in just a second here. But Pelosi said this morning that she doesn't object if swing district candidates run against her, you know, like Connor Lamb did in Pennsylvania. If they have to do that to win the election, I'm all for winning. And then channeling the greasiest, most disgusting NFL owner I can think of, the late Al Davis, you know, the serial extortionist who took the Oakland Raiders to Los Angeles and <laughs> shook down Los Angeles. Then he brought them back to Oakland and shook down Oakland again. His pet phrase was, just win, baby. He didn't care how many penalties, penalties his players got or whether they were juicing. It was just win, baby. And that's what Pelosi said. Just win, baby. I've made some very powerful enemies. They don't say we're against her because she passed health care reform or because she took on Wall Street. She did? <laughs> they say she's San Francisco. Yes, she's liberal. Yes, she's pro-LGBT. Yes. Well, also... I violently disagree with Pelosi's strategy this year. And the latest victim is Kara Eastman, a community activist who is running for the second congressional district in Nebraska. That's outside Omaha. She got in early. She promoted her pro-choice position after the party fumbled uh, a case where the, uh, a guy named uh, Heath Mello was running for mayor of Omaha, and he has a deep anti-choice voting record. And that split Democrats. Pelosi supported him just because he was a Democrat. Bernie Sanders kind of uh, straddled as well. And in the end, Heath Mello lost. But Kara Eastman has good credentials. The Democrats recruited a guy who is a former Republican, Brad Ashford. He has a long history of supporting abortion restrictions. He backed a bill to ban abortions after 20 weeks. And, you know, the Democrats have this red to blue program where they endorse primary candidates because they think they have the better chance of winning. Well, this guy Ashford got the red to blue award, and he personally shifted from red Republican to blue, registering as a Democrat. And he's not the only Republican convert who Democrats are backing over progressives in primaries this year. It's deeply insulting. And also the role of Emily's List has to be called out because they are not getting involved in the race there in Omaha, but they are supporting a candidate in Pennsylvania who uh, is pro-choice and taking on an anti-choice Democrat. Why the double standard? Well, I've had experience with candidates who were backed by Emily's List, and it's a, a curse more than a blessing in my opinion. I worked for Susan Adams, a pro-choice uh, county legislator who was trying to run for an open seat in Congress here. And initially, Emily's List backed her. They gave her a little bit of money, but then they squandered all the money she had raised by forcing her to hire their chosen consultants. And after six months, Emily's List de-endorsed Susan Adams because a self-funding neophyte named Stacy Lawson entered the race. 
Emily's list is, <laughs> is dangerous in many respects, I believe. Over at Who, What, Why today, a good article by Dan Engelke. Headline reads, GOP voter suppression, a bigger problem than Russian meddling? Well, I've made the case for that repeatedly here, and uh, I'm glad to see this echoed to some extent by Who, What, Why. They talk about the voter registration and voter ID laws, the efforts at Republican-led voter suppression. They give a lot of coverage to the interstate cross-checklist, the Chris Kobach project from Kansas. And they talk about the fact that the Republicans just create a lot of barriers for people to vote. And they quote Jonathan Simon, who's been a guest on this program. Since 2002, vote counting has been outsourced and not to the Kremlin. Companies like Dominion and ES&S are tasked to count our votes. It would be hard to find a more secretive and corruptible industry in the United States. He went on to say, This is an exploratory drilling in the Arctic. We have 75% of our vote on paper. What's needed are audits that aren't costly and are actually transparent. Are actually transparent. Instead, we're devising a slew of clever ways to keep it concealed while making it look more transparent. Eric Schneiderman is the emperor with no clothes. Yesterday, he was the attorney general of the state of New York, backing a lot of women in the Me Too movement and attacking predatory males. Then Ronan Farrow and Jane Mayer published a blistering article in the New Yorker magazine. And within three hours, Eric Schneiderman had resigned. The article names two accusers and uh, doesn't name two additional accusers. But their stories are all similar. That Eric Schneiderman was a heavy drinker, two bottles of wine a night. And he would get physical after he got drunk. And in each case, he slapped these women to the extent that they sought medical, uh, medical attention. And... While I often talk about a need for process, these allegations are well-sourced, they're well-corroborated, and I don't dispute Eric Schneiderman's decision to resign. I do want a better process, though, for airing out these obvious grievances and making sure that we don't falsely accuse someone in the future. A couple of drug executives took to Capitol Hill today with a little bit of apology. Here is George Barrett from Cardinal Healthcare. They're a big distributor of prescription drugs. With the benefit of hindsight, I wish we had moved faster and asked a different set of questions. I'm deeply sorry that we did not. Today, I'm confident we would reach different conclusions about the pharmacies in West Virginia towns that got millions of doses of hydrocodone and oxycodone pills. Joseph Mastandrea said his company, Miami Lucan, contributed to the opioid crisis. But then they went on to say that, hey, we shipped a lot of pills in there, but, uh, you know, that's what we do. And we didn't prescribe them. We didn't actually distribute them to end users. But they pumped so much of these opioids into tiny communities that it had to spill over onto the black market. For example, Congressman Greg Waldner, Republican of Oregon, said there's no logical explanation we can find for why a town of about 400 people would receive nearly 9 million opioid pills in two years. And I think if these people have any real remorse, they should open up rehab programs and pay for their victims, their addicted victims, to get rehabilitation. I once met Oliver North. He was on a book tour. I think the book was called Under Fire. And I found him to be a total fraud. He just uh, explained away the Iran-Contra affair as if it was no big deal. And the NRA, looking for a warrior who can talk about good guys with guns, killing bad guys with guns, have named Oliver North as president of the National Rifle Association. We had a charm and PR offensive from Melania Trump yesterday. They trotted her out to the Rose Garden with a teleprompter. She stiffly stood there. And, you know, with a teleprompter, there are two windows. And you're supposed to look back and forth, so it looks like you're looking at the entire crowd before you. But just like her Donald, she stood there and just looked at the left screen. <laughs> and with uh, the excessive makeup 
and uh, eyelash uh, treatment that she has, you can barely see her peepers. Anyway, she announced that for her first lady goodwill, good work, she is going to focus on our chillins. And she announced that uh, she is launching a program called Be Best to teach children how to be good citizens, to be kind, to not bully on social media. <laughs> and, and Trump was standing there cheering her on. And the White House quickly dismissed any claims that Trump sets a bad example for bullying in social media. That was stage one. Stage two was they announced the release of a Be Best pamphlet. And they said that it was co-authored by Melania and the Federal Trade Commission. Only with minor editing changes, it is the same as an FTC publication from 2014, which Michelle Obama took no credit for. <laughs> but, of course, the comparison is obvious after Melania gave a convention speech that cribbed largely from a previous speech by Michelle Obama. This appears to be another case of cribbing, if not outright plagiarism. Now, in the same afternoon, and Rachel Maddow pointed this out last night, Jeff Sessions went to a photo op at the San Diego border and announced zero tolerance at the border. And they're going to punish toddlers and children by separating them from their parents. He threatened, if you smuggle illegal aliens across our border, then we will prosecute you. If you are smuggling a child, we will prosecute you, and that child will be separated from you as required by law. If you don't like that, then don't smuggle children over our border. Gosh, his compassion quotient is off the charts. And that's not all. The other move by the Trump administration, as Melania was starting this PR campaign about our kids, is to cut millions of dollars from the Children's Health Insurance Program. And that was part of a deal brokered to avoid one of the government shutdowns or to end one of them. We can't remember. But this is so insidious. The Republicans have raided the piggy bank for tax cuts for corporations and the wealthy. And now they're trying to fleece children for millions of dollars that will end their health insurance. Yes, Melania speaks with forked tongue. Newly released EPA emails indicate that Scott Pruitt's uh, concern about security is really an, a, an effort to screen out people he doesn't want to talk to from his public events. So the emails show that the schedulers divide people into friendly and unfriendly camps, and the unfriendlies are kept as far away from Pruitt as possible. And this becomes the rationale for his outsized security spending. Meanwhile, a report that I'm sure Scott Pruitt tried to kill, but somehow survived, came out of the agency called the National Toxicology Program. And this was a referral from the EPA related to the toxicity of Roundup and its power ingredient, glyphosate. And the report indicates that glyphosate is not as toxic as the compound Roundup, which includes other chemicals. The report is based on the first ever examination of herbicide formulations made with glyphosate, but that also include other chemicals. While regulators have previously required extensive testing of glyphosate in isolation, government scientists have not fully examined the toxicity of the more complex products sold to consumers, farmers, and to public agencies. Now, this study does appear to contradict a finding by the International Agency for Research on Cancer, finding that glyphosate uh, induce oxidative stress, a potential pathway for cancer. The uh, NTP says that they need to do more research on that. But also, according to The Guardian, internal Monsanto memos dating back 16 years show, quote, you cannot say that Roundup is not a carcinogen. We have not done the necessary testing on the formulation to make that statement. In another internal Monsanto email, 2002, Glyphosate is okay, but the formulated product does the damage. And finally today, Kim Jong-un got on an airplane, which appears to be rare for him, and flew to the Chinese port city of Dalian, 
yesterday, where he met with the Chinese leader Xi Jinping. Now, this is a, a, a breach of protocol because Kim made the trip to Beijing and the Chinese would uh, normally wait for an opportunity to repay that by visiting North Korea. But in preparation for the upcoming meetings with Trump, Kim Jong-un seemed to want to get a little more face time with Xi Jinping. Thanks for listening to my daily news and comment podcast. We give it away free. You're free to share it far and wide, and you'll find it on YouTube. I'm your humble host, Peter B. Collins. Happy trails to you until we meet again. Happy trails.